thank you for joining me for this class on The Bride of Frankenstein. This is both a standalone lecture and video on The Bride of Frankenstein, the movie, and especially an analysis of what's going on in this movie, and it is also a final bonus class in an eight-week-long course I offer on Frankenstein the Book by Mary Shelley. This class is intended to be for everyone. You don't have to have taken the course to understand and follow this class on Bride of Frankenstein. But if you're interested, if based on, especially if based on this class, you're interested in more, go to clockworksacademy.com and find out more about the courses that I offer, eight week long courses on Frankenstein, Dracula, a medieval werewolves course as I record this is coming up soon and depending on when you're listening to it it may have happened in the past and more I have plans to do a course on Beowulf and a course on zombies in the near future you can again find out all about all those things at clockworksacademy.com I'm Dr. Paul Moffat you can see me there that hat I'm wearing is a doctor hat I have a PhD in literature. So my regular courses are focused on books, are focused on literature, and in these bonus classes I talk about adaptation and the movies that are based on the books, and so because I am a literature scholar, I'm going to be thinking about and looking at Bride of Frankenstein through that lens, from the perspective of a literature scholar primarily. Our plan for the agenda of this class, we will first talk a little bit about adaptation in theory, we'll talk just a little bit about monsters in theory, and then we'll spend most of the class talking about The Bride of Frankenstein. Before I move on from here, I'd also encourage you to check out my video on the 1931 Frankenstein movie, to which this movie is a sequel. And if I know what I'm doing, You'll find a link to that popping up in the middle of the screen, and if I don't know what I'm doing, you can just click in my channel and find it there. I hope I figure it out. Let's move forward, though. In my video about 1931 Frankenstein, I talk a bit about adaptation theory, and you can go and watch that. I don't want to repeat myself too much and be tedious about it, so I'm going to talk about adaptation briefly from a different perspective today in that we usually think about adaptation in terms of texts as turning one thing into another thing. But I'm kind of more interested, especially in the context of The Bride of Frankenstein, in thinking much more broadly about what adaptation means. The Bride of Frankenstein is not only an adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein, it is also an adaptation of the 1931 original movie Frankenstein. And that leads maybe to a question, or at least arguably it is, that leads to a question, is a sequel an adaptation? And if not, how does a sequel relate to the original text? And that leads me to what I really am more interested in focusing on in for today's class, and that's not so much adaptation as intertextuality. What does intertextuality mean? To understand that, we need to remember what a text is in the context of literary theory. I mentioned this in my previous video about the 1931 Frankenstein, but I'll say it again now. A text is anything that can be read, not just words on paper. Intertextuality, in simple terms, is about how one text relates to another text, or rather how a number of texts are connected to each other to become an intertext. The term intertextuality comes to us from Julia Kristeva, who is a literary scholar, theory, uh, literary theorist, philosopher, and now novelist. It comes from her book Desire in Language. And Kristeva's understanding of intertextuality is complicated and nuanced, and I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction to it today. I'm not trying to explain it fully. But the idea of intertextuality, as Kristeva puts it, is that the addressee, 
quite simply the reading subject, represents a doubly oriented entity, signifier in relation to the text and signified in relation between the subject of narration and himself. In other words, the intertextuality, the connection between texts, or the, the relationship between texts, exists in the mind of the reader, because the reading subject is a signifier in relation to the text, that means the reading subject creates the meaning of the text by reading it. But intertextuality also exists in the mind of the narrator, that is, when someone is telling a story, they're thinking about other stories, other texts, and I say a story because I'm talking about stories, but Kristeva wants to include a scientific text, a legal text, a letter, a whatever. When the narrator of a text creates a text, they're thinking of other stuff, and that other stuff is connected to the text that they're making within their own mind. Intertextuality exists in the text itself, in that the text is also a signifier that points to meaning. Signifier signified, you don't have to worry too much about what that means, uh, but signifier points to a meaning, signified is what is being pointed to. That's not that important for today, for my context. But the text is is a signifier that points to a meaning, and whether I understand it or not, it's doing the pointing. And intertextuality exists in the language. Words have meaning that are created by their context and by the culture and by the history of the language, and it, whether the narrator knows what the words mean or the reader knows what the words mean, the meaning is still embedded in the language because the language exists in a context that doesn't just disappear just because I don't recognize it. So all of those things are at the same time. The intertextuality is in the mind of the reader, the intertextuality is in the mind of the narrator, the intertextuality is in the text itself, and the intertextuality is in the language of the text. All of that, we could go on and on about what it means, but to boil it down for what I care about today, the point there is that we don't have to talk about intertextuality the way that we might want to talk about adaptation as happening in only one direction in time. Because when I read a text, when I watch Bride of Frankenstein, if I recognize connections to other texts, the intertextuality exists in my mind and they, they are part of the intertext. That is a legitimate, valuable, worthwhile understanding of what's going on in this text. So that means Bride of Frankenstein is in dialogue with 1931 Frankenstein, to which it is a sequel, also to the Frankenstein the novel, but also to Young Frankenstein, the uh, Mel Brooks movie that makes reference to Bride of Frankenstein, even though Bride of Frankenstein isn't an adaptation of Young Frankenstein, and Young Frankenstein is a parody of Bride of Frankenstein in some parts, not an adaptation directly, but it's an intertext. It goes in both directions. And if I watched Young Frankenstein first and then watch Bride of Frankenstein, as far as my experience of the text is concerned, Bride of Frankenstein might as well be an adaptation of Young Frankenstein. And all that really for the context of this class is my long-winded way of saying, I don't really care if, uh, if I make a connection, if you make a connection, if you see a connection between this movie and another movie, the, uh, the historical context of, no, James Well could not possibly have known this other movie, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who knew what in terms of our, inter in terms of our interpretation of the intertextuality. If the connections are there, they're there, whether the creator knew about them or not. And part of the point of pointing them out is so that then the intertext will be present in your mind as a reader because you'll recognize it. Now, despite me saying all of that in so much length, I'm not actually going to do a ton of pointing out intertext for Bride of Frankenstein, but I hope that you will notice some as you watch the movie and as you think back on it later, because Bride of Frankenstein is a very influential movie in the con in 
the history of horror film, but also in the history of film in general. And I'll maybe point out one or two things, but that all this preamble is to give a theoretical context. And speaking of the theoretical context, let's talk just for a moment about monsters. Again, this is something I covered in my video on the 1931 Frankenstein, and if you'd like more on this, go watch that video. I'm going to come at this from a little bit of a different perspective this time, but as I said in that last video, monster comes to English from the Latin monstrare, which means to show. That's where we get the English word demonstrate, which also means to show. Monsters show. The point of a monster story, the point of a monster, is that it shows something. Now, what do monsters show? My usual answer is that monsters show us fears, desires, and boundaries. I'm going to focus a little bit differently because I explained that perspective in the Frankenstein 1931 video, and that's not the only way to understand monsters. So today I'm going to touch on a couple of points that I found in a book, Monster Theory, by Jeffrey Jerome Cohen. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen is the editor of this book, and he has an essay in this book called uh, Seven Theses on Monsters. And I'm not quoting him directly. But just if you're looking for the root of this way of thinking about monsters, this is where it comes to me from. So the first thing I want to say here is that a monster is a text. Remember I said a text is anything that can be read? The text is not only the book. It's not only the movie. The monster themselves. The monster, in the case of The Bride of Frankenstein, himself and herself. Both monsters are texts. They have culturally constructed meanings. The monster's body is culturally constructed. It is only in the context of a specific cultural situation that we can recognize a monster. A particular body in a particular shape is only monstrous because the culture constructs it to be monstrous. And the way that the culture constructs it to be monstrous tells us things about the culture and about the cultural assumptions and the monster, in other words, is a text. The second thing to I want to say about monsters today is that the monster always escapes. This is one of Cohen's theses and I think it's important in the context of The Bride of Frankenstein because The monster ostensibly dies at the end of the first Frankenstein movie, and yet returns here for the second movie. And the original title, until late in the production of this movie, the title of this movie was going to be The Return of Frankenstein. And then the monster apparently dies at the end of this movie, but we know this is not the last movie. There is another movie, The Son of Frankenstein, in which the monster is again played by Boris Karloff, And even after Boris Karloff retires, there are other actors who play the monster in the Universal Pictures Frankenstein movies. Glenn Strange and Bela Lugosi plays the monster sometimes. And even after Universal stops making Frankenstein movies, there are the Hammer Frankenstein movies, there are the Kenneth Branagh-directed Mary Shelley's Frankenstein There's the small uh, renaissance of Frankenstein shows and movies in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and that, all of that is to say that the monster always escapes does not mean necessarily that the monster literally escapes at the end of the story, although very often the monster does literally escape at the end of the story, and the end of the book Frankenstein, the monster is borne away by darkness and distance, and we don't actually see what happens to it. But even when the monster seems to literally die, there is always the possibility of the monster returning, because the monster always escapes, because the monster always might come back, because if the monster is a culturally constructed body that represents cultural fears, anxieties, desires, preoccupations, those fears, desires, and 
anxieties, preoccupations don't go away at the end of the movie. So all the things that caused the monster in the first place, culturally speaking, still exist. And so the monster always escapes, and the monster always returns. And Bride of Frankenstein is a great example of that. This is the movie that turned Frankenstein into a franchise. James Whale, who directed this movie, did not originally want to come back. But the draw of Frankenstein was too strong. And there's more nuance to why he came back, but... he, Of course he came back. The monster always comes back. The monster always returns. The monster always escapes. And the last thing about monsters in theory that I want to say in the context of this class is a bit of a variation on what I said about monsters in my Frankenstein 1931 class, and that is monster stories are about boundaries. And I have said in the past, I often say that monster stories are about telling us the boundary between monster and human. When we see what a monster is, it helps us understand or imagine what no longer counts as human. But monster stories don't just show us the boundary between human and monster, they also show us the boundary between possible and impossible. Think of the cliché of the map with the edge of the map, here there be monsters. Outside the boundaries of what is allowed, of what is approved culturally, of what is possible, on the other side of that, that's where monsters are. That's what monsters are. And monsters are both about clarifying those boundaries and also about troubling those boundaries. The Part of the anxiety behind monster stories is the possibility that something might cross that boundary from impossible to possible. And Frankenstein's monster is one of the most potent examples of that, Frankenstein's monster should not be alive, but is. He has crossed the boundary from impossible into possible, and it's his very existence is what is uncanny and unnerving and frightening. And the Boris Karloff version of Frankenstein, Boris Karloff gives Frankenstein's monster so much vulnerability and pathos, even though he's killing people. And by the way, the version of The Bride of Frankenstein that we see is a shortened version for the, because the censors did not approve the original version directed by James Whale in which the monster kills more people and Carl the gravedigger kills more people. So there's a higher body count in the original vision of Bride of Frankenstein, which the original vision doesn't matter at all, except to say, the monster's killing people. But even though he kills people, he's vulnerable he is, uh, we empathize with him, we sympathize with him. But what the difference between, but even though we sympathize with him, even though we empathize with him, and even though he's not the only person on the screen killing people, he's the monster because he shouldn't exist. Carl the Gravedigger is just a bad, creepy guy. Dr. Pretorius is just a bad, creepy guy. Neither of them are monsters because they're inside the boundaries of what's possible. They don't trouble this boundary line in the way that the creature does. I've already started doing it a little bit, so let's get actually into the text. Let's actually talk about The Bride of Frankenstein directly. And what I want to say about The Bride of Frankenstein to start... And I know, to start, I've been talking 20 minutes and now I say to start. But in my imagination, everything I said before was about adaptation in general and monsters in general. And now I'm talking about this movie specifically. What I want to get to to start talking about The Bride of Frankenstein is to talk about the idea of art as a metaphor for making art. And that's a common thing. We see that all the time, right? We see whenever you have a movie about a high-pressure job where they have to do their big presentation to that's going to make or break their career that's a metaphor for pitching a movie we see that in every movie that is made about a brilliant artist or a brilliant chef or a brilliant uh, 
They're all metaphors for making... For, the artist makes metaphors about making art, right? Frankenstein, the book, is very easy to read as a metaphor. And this is... We talked about this in the eight-week-long course on the book that I just finished. Frankenstein, the book, is very easy to read as being, in part, a metaphor about making, about writing a book. Mary Shelley, just like Frankenstein, creates a monster. Frankenstein's monster is the creature. Mary Shelley's monster is this grotesque book that she's proud of, but a little bit scared of, but a little bit worried about what people are going to think of her because she wrote this creepy book. And we have in the movie the same thing. I talked in my class on Frankenstein 1931 about how the making of a movie is a lot like the making of a creature in Frankenstein. It's stitched together from parts, uh, and movies are literally, are almost literally stitched together. What is this movie saying about making a movie, about making art? Why is this preface here? This is Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron. And the if you are unfamiliar, the story of how Frankenstein the novel was written it's a little bit of an apocryphal story, a little bit exaggerated, but this is a representation of the real story of how Mary Shelley uh, wrote Frankenstein. She and Percy Shelley were on vacation, and they met up with Lord Byron and were staying near and were staying near his house. And it was stormy and cold, and Byron suggested that everyone write a ghost story. And everyone made up a ghost story and Mary Shelley couldn't think of one. And when she finally did think of one, she wrote it all down and it became the novel Frankenstein. And so this preface imagines Mary Shelley and Lord Byron and Percy Shelley sitting around in Byron's house on a stormy night. And Mary Shelley is telling them her story. There, there were other people there who are erased from the... From the story. Poor John Polidori. With his preface with Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron, why is it here? It is a reference to the creation of Frankenstein the book, but I mean, it's is it doing the same thing as a Disney movie opening the storybook at the beginning? Partly. It's welcoming you into the story, creating a frame narrative that both distances you from the movie by saying this isn't a real thing, we're not presenting this as a real thing that happened. Commentating, it's a meta-commentary on the making of the movie. When Lord Byron says, it's a shame that your monster story is over so soon, we want more. I do think it a shame, Mary, to end your story quite so suddenly. That wasn't the end at all. Lord Byron represents the movie-going public who watched James Whale's 1931 Frankenstein movie and said, give us more. Or alternatively, Lord Byron represents Universal Studios, who saw that the 1931 Frankenstein movie made a lot of money and asked James Whale to give them more. It also is a mechanism of, uh, just like Frankenstein the book, is a kind of is a genre of fiction called epistolary fiction where it's told as if it's letters so you uh get the story as written down by someone who heard it and sent in a letter to someone and the effect that in the book it being epistolary fiction has is that it moves the outer layer into realism so that then the fantastic things in the story are both mediated through a narrator who we can pretend to believe in, and then also they're kind of verified by someone who is an, uh, an impartial observer who saw this and isn't involved in the story but is just repeating what he saw. Mary Shelley's frame narrative here telling the story kind of does all of that, encourages us as viewers to play along, but it also does the exact opposite. In the novel, that frame narrative says this is a really true story that really happened, and we know it's not, but we're invited to kind of pretend and play along as if it is. 
in the movie, that frame narrative said, this is a made up story that Mary Shelley is making up. So it's not encouraging us to disregard our suspension of disbelief. It's encouraging us to view the whole thing at an arm's length of meta irony. As a bit of a side note, I absolutely love Elsa Lanchester's performance here as Mary Shelley. It will be published, I think. Except wait, maybe it's not a side note at all, because Elsa Lanchester plays both Mary Shelley and the monster's mate, as this character is called in the credits. And the question mark in the credits here is a callback to the 1931 Frankenstein movie where Boris Karloff was credited as question mark as the monster in the opening credits, and then he's was credited in the end credits. You can see, by the way, now this really is a tangent, you can see that Boris Karloff's fame has risen a lot since the first movie that they're now giving him top billing with his name in great big letters, Karloff! Um, some background history, Bela Lugosi was originally cast as Frankenstein and it's unclear what exactly happened, but the story goes... The Bell Lugosi rejected the role as Frankenstein's monster because he didn't want to perform under a load of makeup and not talking. And so Boris Karloff was cast instead, and then Boris Karloff became a bigger star for Universal than Bell Lugosi was. And Boris Karloff's performance as Frankenstein made him the gave him top billing over Bell Lugosi as Dracula. That really is a side note. What my point was going to be. Elsa Lanchester plays the monster's mate. And Mary Shelley. Why is the same person playing these two roles? I think I think she is fantastic in both roles. Her presence on screen as the monster's mate is such a very small amount of screen time, but has such an enormously lasting effect on the movie and on horror cinema in general, and that's partly due to the makeup, and I'll talk about the makeup a bit in a second. Why is she played by the same character? It's a way of emphasizing this point that Mary Shelley is also creating the monster. The point is just that Mary Shelley is associated with her creature, with a creature in her story. That Mary Shelley is also creating the monster just as much as Victor is. And that Mary Shelley here, that the way that the female creature is both an object of desire and also uh, frightening and also denied her agency and also the entire movie hinges on her agency all of that is all wrapped up in mary shelley's character too now i keep stumbling over i keep saying the monster's mate the female creature the movie credits her as the monster's mate why are we all tiptoeing around calling her the bride of frankenstein isn't that this character's name isn't she the bride of frankenstein one of the reasons I said a second ago that for a long time in... A long time? For a lot of the production of this movie, the working title was The Return of Frankenstein, not The Bride of Frankenstein. And part of the reason for that is that the make the studio thought there was a lot of ambiguity in the title The Bride of Frankenstein. They thought people wouldn't be sure who that was referring to. And they had a point. I suspect that James Whale wanted there to be ambiguity, that for him that was the point, was that there was ambiguity. The Bride of Frankenstein is not Elsa Lanchester's character necessarily, although she does get explicitly named the Bride of Frankenstein in the movie. The Bride of Frankenstein. But that's, I mean, that's a, if you stop to think about it, that's a strange thing to call her. First of all, she's not anybody's bride. The mate of Frankenstein that the credits give her is dehumanizing, and, I mean, if we're going to go there, she's not quite human. But the bride sounds a little bit better than mate because it gives her a little bit more humanity. But she's not the bride of anyone. She doesn't marry anyone. Let's make that, you know, spell that out. And if we're going to answer who's the bride of Frankenstein, who's Frankenstein? Frankenstein. 
I am sure that you have had people, or maybe you yourself have said, well, actually, Frankenstein is the name of the scientist, not the monster. I think the uh, correct way to say that is more like, well, actually. And I said in the 1931 Frankenstein movie, in my class on the 1931 Frankenstein movie, I pointed out that in the movie, the monster does get called Frankenstein. And in The Son of Frankenstein, the movie that comes after this, the village also gets called Frankenstein. Let's go to the village of the village Frankenstein, where we will meet the scientist Frankenstein who created the monster Frankenstein. The movie naming the creature Frankenstein, and Bride of Frankenstein doesn't do this, but 1931 Frankenstein does, makes it confusing who the Bride of Frankenstein would be. Is the Bride of Frankenstein the Bride of Henry or the Bride of the Creature? And by the way, another little tangent. Doc, the scientist Frankenstein is named Victor in the book, but his first name is Henry in the movie. So Henry Frankenstein is the movie f- scientist's name. Okay, back to what I was saying. Is the Bride of Frankenstein the Bride of Henry or the Bride of the Creature? And if the Bride of Frankenstein is the Bride of Henry, then Elsa Lanchester's character isn't the Bride of Frankenstein. Elizabeth is the Bride of Frankenstein. And actually, the movie starts with them not married and ends with them married. So she is the actual Bride of Frankenstein in this movie. If you watched 1931 Frankenstein or my lecture on it, you might notice that Elizabeth has changed. Valerie Hobson replaced May Clark in the role of Elizabeth. That, I mean, the reason for that is a real-world unhappy reason that May Clark was in a car accident uh, and suffered extensive facial scarring. She went back to acting eventually, but she was not up for acting in a movie at this point. She got in the accident just before this movie started. So Valerie Hobson replaced May Clark. But it's the same character. She's Elizabeth. She's the Bride of Frankenstein. The actual Bride of Frankenstein. And notice actually that the movie is not The Bride of Frankenstein. It's just Bride of Frankenstein. So there's not necessarily only one. But whether it's a or the, if Elizabeth is a Bride of Frankenstein, that should lead us to wonder. Bride of Frankenstein and yet has such a small presence in the movie... That should lead us to think about Elsa Lanchester's Bride of Frankenstein, who also has a very small presence in the movie. She has a large impact on the movie, but she's not physically on screen for very long at all. What is going on with women in Bride of Frankenstein? And I want to point out the way that most of the time when we see women in Bride of Frankenstein, we see one woman in between two men. Sometimes literally in between, as we see the female creature standing in between Henry Frankenstein and Dr. Pretorius. Sometimes emotionally in between, as we see the female creature between Henry and Boris Karloff's creature, as Elizabeth between Henry and Pretorius. And even Mary Shelley in the beginning is in between Percy Shelley and Lord Byron. The women in this movie, from Elizabeth to the creature's mate to Mary Shelley, the women are present to mediate relationships between men. And often they're there to mediate relationships between queer men. It is not clear. There is certainly nothing textual that says that Henry Frankenstein is gay. Although, let me remind you that James Whale, the director of this movie, was atypically for 1935 openly gay in Hollywood as a director. But in any case, there's nothing that says that Henry Frankenstein explicitly says that Henry Frankenstein is gay or that any of the characters are gay. But let's start with Dr. Pretorius, who is certainly, in his mannerisms, campy... I thought I was alone. He has been described in the criticism of the movie as sissified. 
or as a sissy, which is Hollywood code for queer. And according to David Skull, James Whale directed Ernest Thesiger to play Dr. Pretorius as an over-the-top caricature of a bitchy and aging homosexual. We can see that caricature on screen. There's an older... There's a version of the script that didn't actually make it onto the screen where Dr. Pretorius says to Henry, you have the opportunity... I'm paraphrasing the exact line, but it's something very close to... You have the opportunity of procreating in a natural way, but all that's left for me is by making a creature. And that could be a commentary on his age, but it also is easy to read as a commentary on homosexuality, as even in the original Frankenstein book, the concept of men making... The concept of the creature is the idea of making women irrelevant uh, in their procreative capacity, finding a way to procreate without any women having to be involved, it's easy to read that as rejecting heterosexual pairings. Or look at the creature as a queer figure. A lot of the, the narrative thrust of this story revolves around making a mate for him, but he never explicitly seeks a mate. He doesn't want one, unlike in the book where it's he's the one asking for a fellow creature. Dr. Pretorius is driving this in the movie, and the creature, Dr. Pretorius explains the uh, female creature as a friend. That is to say that the creature is not actively seeking a heterosexual partnership either. He's essentially oblivious to it. And even look at Henry Frankenstein, who is married, gets married through the course of the movie, though off-screen, has an actual bride, yet Pretorius shows up and takes Henry literally away from his marriage bed. Henry is lying in bed with Elizabeth, and Pretorius shows up and takes Henry away from Elizabeth. So, symbolically, Pretorius is something that Henry, someone that Henry chooses over his wife. And we saw, not his wife yet at this point, over his potential wife. We saw the same thing happening, not with Pretorius, but with Henry's friend Victor in the 1931 Frankenstein movie. Women are in between the relationships of men, and the men choose other men instead of choosing to stay with the women. And even now, I just said, hey, let's talk about women in this movie, and then I didn't at all. I talked about men in this movie, because despite the movie being called Bride of Frankenstein, the women's presence is quite small. And when they appear, it is usually to be pushed aside, or to be walked away from. And the climax of the movie might be an exception to that, because although the female creature is in the middle, literally in the middle of Pretorius and Henry at first, physically in the middle of Pretorius and Henry, and uh, symbolically, there's a brief, almost romantic uh, love triangle where she prefers the company of Henry over Boris Karloff's creature. And Boris Karloff's creature reacts not with jealousy, but with despair. She hate me like all the others. She hate me like others. Despite the fact that she is created for him, for the pleasure of Dr. Pretorius as a creator, for the uh, purposes of Henry Frankenstein, who wants to use her to get Elizabeth back, for the purpose of, as a sexual object and a, a as an object for Boris Karloff's creature, at the climactic moment of the movie, she still has her choice and she still has her agency and it's her 
turning her eyes outward, looking at the world and deciding what she wants, that brings the whole thing crashing down. And the creature says, the creature pulls the lever, the mysterious lever, that the self-destruct lever in the lab, um, and lets Henry and Elizabeth leave, but won't let Dr. Pretorius leave because Dr. Pretorius belongs dead. Yes, go, you live, go. You stay, we belong dead. Why does the creature say that he and Pretorius and the uh, female creature belong dead while Henry and Elizabeth belong alive? Because although the movie starts with Mary Shelley, although it starts by disrupting heterosexual relationships, it ends by reaffirming them. And it ends by saying, Henry and Elizabeth go off, have a child, uh... They continue, they are allowed to continue because they're procreative and they're heterosexual. This is an ending, by the way, that the studio insisted on and James Well didn't want. He wanted Henry and Elizabeth to die. But the ending that the movie gives us is the queer figures all get destroyed and the heterosexual procreative couple go off and escape in order to create children in the future. And the next movie, sure enough, is called The Son of Frankenstein. And The Son of Frankenstein in the title of the next movie is The Son of Henry Frankenstein, not The Son of Boris Karloff's Frankenstein's Monster. The monster is the same in the next movie. He has survived the destruction at the end of this movie because the monster always escapes. I want to just mention the makeup in this movie, just to say the makeup of Frankenstein's Monster is done by makeup artist Jack Pierce. He returns here on The Bride of Frankenstein. He does Boris Karloff's makeup again. He's behind the design of Frankenstein that we all associate with Frankenstein. The square head and the bolts on the side and the green skin. Although uh, Jack Pierce did not envision Frankenstein's monster having green skin, he gave him a blue-green face paint so that he would look dead and grey on a black and white film. But in any case, <clears throat> he's behind all of that design of Frankenstein's monster. He's also behind the design of the female creature. And I just want to shout that out because she is on screen for such a very short amount of time. She doesn't return in the uh, future movies. That design of the Bride of Frankenstein with the big hair with white streaks up the sides of it, that comes from this movie. And it is Jack Pierce's design. And it's, uh, has had a huge impact on popular culture again. Another uh, one just like the design of Frankenstein's monster that has a huge impact on popular culture. That design is meant to be uh, reminiscent. She's supposed to look like a mummy wrapped up in bandages. And we can see here that she does. And her hair design is inspired by Nefertiti. And then the white up the side is meant to be suggestive of electricity. We also might mention that, uh, as a matter of trivia, Jack Pierce is also the makeup artist behind the silent film The Man Who Laughs. And The Man Who Laughs was the visual inspiration for Joker. You can see how much Conrad Veidt's Gwynplaine, as designed by Jack Pierce, looks exactly like Joker, especially early Joker. So it's not that much of a... It's only slightly exaggerating to say that the same person who designed the look of Frankenstein's monster also designed the look of the Joker. Talking about the man that who laughs brings me to a discussion, a short discussion of some of the of some of the influences we can recognize in the Bride of Frankenstein. But I want to draw your attention to two earlier silent films that have a really strong intertextual relationship with the Bride of Frankenstein. And those are The Magician and Metropolis. Metropolis is a 1927 silent film directed by Fritz Lang. A character, uh, Rotwang, kidnaps a woman and transfers her likeness to a robot. So there's 
a lot more happens in the story, but at one, at part of the story of Metropolis is the creation of a female creature. And you can see here, I hope, how the lab in which the creation of the creature happens and the scene of the creation of the creature, Maria, robot, is very reminiscent of the creation of the female creature in The Bride of Frankenstein. The other movie to mention, to be aware of, is is a 1926 American silent horror film, The Magician, directed by Rex Ingram. And The Magician is also a story about someone creating life. As the title suggests, magic, not science. He's not building a robot, he's creating life. He has to kidnap a maiden and use her blood to create life. And we can see here how Oliver Haddo, the magician in The Magician, his lab is very, very reminiscent of Frankenstein's lab, or the other way around. Frankenstein's lab is very, very reminiscent of Haddo's lab. And the cre- the uh, the climactic scene where Haddo tries to steal the blood from the woman, Margaret, who he has kidnapped, is very familiar when you watch The Bride of Frankenstein. The Magician Haddo, by the way, is played by Paul Wegener, who was also a director of silent films and directed the movie, the German movie, Der Gollum. I talked about that in my class on the 1931 Frankenstein movie, and it, he plays the Gollum in that movie, and it is one of the influential films on Frankenstein as well. So James Whale, clearly, it is clear to see the influence that silent film and German Expressionism particularly has on James Whale. And a lot of The Bride of Frankenstein and Frankenstein both show influence of German Expressionism. We can see here the scene where Frankenstein's monster is running away from the crowd and he's traveling through this forest. And the Expressionism, there's more to it, but one aspect of Expressionism is the set design is externalizing of the emotional reality of the characters. So the set looks like, in a kind of abstract representational way, looks like how the characters are feeling. And so Frankenstein's monster is running through this forest, and it's a dead forest. There's rocks, there's dirt, there's leafless trees. This is a very deliberately constructed set made to evoke this sense of barrenness and emptiness and death. And Frankenstein's monster is running through it, not through a living lush forest. That said, James Whale is not an expressionist. He's influenced by expressionists, and there are moments in The Bride of Frankenstein that aren't expressionist at all. Like, there's nothing expressionist about the scene in the hermit's hut, for example. This is close to naturalism in terms of the set design and the a lot of this movie goes from naturalism to parody to uh, expressionism. James Whale has a lot of visual language in his toolbox that he is willing to switch between when he feels that it's appropriate. And the tone of this movie switches from humor to pathos to horror to he's he's moving in his register quite a bit in this movie much more than he does in 1931 Frankenstein while we're talking about the hermit's hut there's two things i want to say about the hermit's hut and one is to comment just for a moment on disability in this movie i talked about disability in the 1931 Frankenstein movie how fritz the hunchback represents how alienation is embodied in that movie. And I want to draw attention to the way that disability is portrayed quite differently in this movie. That on one hand, Frankenstein's monster is alienated from the villagers and from the community by virtue of his strange monstrous body. But we also have the blind hermit whose blindness is emphasized and who's blind and this is an aspect that is taken from Mary Shelley's novel. His blindness is emphasized. It is a grounds for 
connection between the creature and the hermit. It is grounds for uh, sympathy, both our sympathy for him and his sympathy for others. And so it is not unlike Fritz the Hunchback in the last movie. He is not um, a character of stratifying power who alienated himself, then turns that into a rationale for alienating and and attacking the creature. But it is a, we might say, a, a quite a sentimental portrait of disability. It makes, it creates this link between the creature and the hermit. And then he, I mean, the, the cliche of he, he sees something metaphorically exactly because he doesn't see something literally. And at the same time as I want to draw attention to that, I want to, the, there's good things and bad things about this kind of representation. Because on one hand, it recognizes the essential humanity of a disabled character, which the previous movie was in danger of, was in danger of dehumanizing disabled bodies. But at the same time as it recognizes his essential humanity, it also idealizes him in a way that is itself a different kind of dehumanizing. That this is an example of a disabled body that is magically disabled, that is able to perceive things by virtue of his disability. And there's a long literary tradition of blind seers who can understand things that physical vision keeps other people from seeing. And that's, you know, problematic because they're blind people uh, aren't magic. They just don't see as well. The other thing, though, to talk about when we're talking about the blind hermit is the religious imagery in this scene and in the whole of Frankenstein. We could talk about it in the whole of Frankenstein, but I want to just focus on this moment right here. Remember, this is bread. Bread. <laughs> Bread. And this is wine. To drink. 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 The hermit gives Frankenstein's monster Go bread and wine. And he says, this is bread. This is good. This is wine. This is good. Those particular foods have a strong meaning within a Christian religious context. This is a scene of the Eucharist. This is a scene of communion. And all the different meanings of that. Because on one hand, it's the Last Supper because the creature is about to be attacked. So it's the last supper together. But also it's a moment of communion. Communion in the sense of community and joining together. But also it's a moment of religious meaning and the creature isn't the Christ figure the blind hermit is who is sharing the bread and wine with the creature the way that he is welcoming to the creature and hospitable and inviting everybody into his home is a model of of the kind of behavior that the movie uh wants to set up as good in a like divinely good kind of way I said I would only talk about this scene. I want to focus mostly on this scene. When the villagers catch up to the creature, they strap him to a pole and it is clear, again, crucifixion imagery. And the idea here is irony, not parody. This is, I'm getting the, uh, the, the language here that I'm using, irony, not parody, comes from the comes from the commentary by film historian Scott McQueen on the DVD of Bride of Frankenstein, which I watched. But I think he's quite right that what is happening here is not parody. The effect of this is to ironically generate sympathy for the creature, to emphasize the irony in order to evoke a sympathetic and emotional reaction to heighten our sympathy for the creature. I have one last question about The Bride of Frankenstein, that I just can't move on from... Well, I was talking about different modes that James Whale uses, that there's expressionism, that there's naturalism. I want to draw attention to 
to Dr. Pretorius's creation of tiny people. This is a parodic moment. This isn't irony. This is parody, and it's played for humor and camp, and there's something surreal here. What is going on with this scene? Why does Dr. Pretorius make tiny people? And there's longer answers, but whenever we ask a why question about a movie, we can ask within the movie and from the perspective of the artist. So within the movie, he makes tiny people because it's easier, I guess. He can't figure out how to make big people. But outside the movie, why does James Whale have Dr. Pretorius make tiny people? And I think the answer is that they are toys to him. It is a character note that represents the way that Dr. Pretorius sees the world and sees his creations. He makes tiny people to play with. He keeps them in a little jar. He, there are no hint of humanity within them. That is a commentary not so much on them as on how he sees the world. He is making things to play with. And when he makes, wants to make a mate for the creature, that is all. He sees everyone, including Henry, including the monster, including Elsa Lanchester's female creature. He sees them all as toys for himself to play with. I also want to, while I am talking about people who did a great job on this movie, Franz Waxman wrote the score to this movie. This is a really great score. Think of the timpani going bum bum for the heartbeat of the female creature during the creation scene. Or that musical theme for the creature that sounds like the that uh, Boris Karloff growls for the creature. The other thing to remember about this movie is this is still very early in talkies. This is still very early in movies even having soundtracks written specifically for them. Uh, they were figuring out still the technology and the practice of this. So this is an influential film score for how to do a film score. It's worth paying attention. You can Google it. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it... You can find it as an album on Spotify, I believe, released 1993 from Silva America. It's definitely worth listening to on its own as a piece of music. And let's end there. If you would like to ask me anything about this class, about Bride of Frankenstein, you can contact me in the comments here on YouTube or also by email paul at clockworksacademy.com or find and follow me on Twitter at Dr. Moffat. I have monster courses coming up as of the recording of this class. There is a Dracula course coming out soon, beginning the end of June, June 24th. There is a course on werewolves and medieval werewolf stories beginning July 5th. And a new Frankenstein course will begin eventually. There's a date on the webpage, but it's a while in the future. So if you'd like to spend some time with me doing something a little bit like this video, but where I am actually in my element of my expertise as a literature scholar, Go to clockworksacademy.com, sign up for the courses. I'd be so happy to have you in one of these courses. I have been Dr. Paul Moffat. Goodbye. Goodbye.